SJC 10667, Commonwealth v. Kenji Drayton. Ms. Anderson, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Teresa Anderson, on behalf of the Commonwealth, we're asking this court to reverse the motion judge's decision allowing the defendant's motion for a new trial in this no, case. No, that's an abuse of discretion standard, correct? It is. So um, that's a tough hurdle for you to overcome. It is, um, and we, we take no, um, no qualms with the motion judge's factual findings. In this case, this court remanded for an evidentiary hearing on the defendant's first motion for a new trial. It presented the defendant with an opportunity to develop evidence to support his claim that this newly discovered affidavit bared persuasive indicia of trustworthiness. But don't you have a really high hurdle to get over his finding that it was trustworthy given that he heard from Grossberg and he, he, he developed the circumstances of, um, of the affidavit? And I guess that's my point is, Your Honor, we take no issue with the fact that the circumstances surrounding how the affidavit came into existence um, played out the way Attorney Grossberg testified. The issue is with the substance of the affidavit. If a court were to allow this as substantive evidence, the actual statements in and of themselves need to bear the persuasive indicia of trustworthiness. And the defendant had an opportunity to, to develop that. He had an opportunity to call witnesses, and he chose only to call his attorney, Attorney Grossberg, who has no personal knowledge about the facts in that affidavit. Again, there's no issue with how the affidavit came into existence. The question is whether the affidavit in and of itself is trustworthy. And the defendant could have pursued multiple avenues to establish that if, in fact, it were the case. Um, and I, for the number of reasons set out in the brief, I, I don't think that it's trustworthy. In fact, it's con such, such as what? Calling the sister? Uh, I, I'm, what, what should they have done to strengthen this? And I, they put, you put me in the role there to, um, to present the evidence. Um, and I, I think that Mr. James Jackson would probably be the best witness for the defendant to call. Um, if, in fact, he had lied at trial and that Deborah Bell's affidavit was true, uh, if at a motion for new trial hearing, Mr. Jackson were to come forward and testify and say, you're right, I lied under oath. In the, I lied to the police first. I lied in the grand jury. I lied in a motion to suppress hearing. I lied at trial. Again, we have all of these sworn statements, which go back to my original point, that I don't think that the affidavit in and of itself bears indicia of trustworthiness, where there are statements to the contrary made under oath. But again, if, if something else were to materialize to support the underlying isn't facts. That, isn't that an impossible burden that in order to establish trustworthiness, the government, the, the defense has to call the witness who's being contradicted to essentially recant testimony? It, it may be, but he needs to support it in some way. And I, that's the first and I think the most natural that comes to mind. Um, perhaps if there was an excited utterance of this woman, Deborah Bell, made to someone else thereafter, perhaps if the co-defendant who was acquitted um, were to come forward and testify, perhaps if there were, again, we're dealing in the realm of were and maybe and possibilities. And so that in and of itself is not enough to demonstrate that this affidavit is trustworthy in and of itself in the substance. Isn't that what, I'm sorry, isn't that what judges do every day when we ask them to determine whether a statement is voluntary? They take the evidence before them and they decide whether or not a, this person seems to be telling the truth, and B, whether or not I believe them, or, or I guess that's the same inquiry. But, but, but you know, he, here we have a, an experienced trial judge who hears from an attorney. He understands the circumstances surrounding it. In fact, um, Ms. Bell seemed terminally ill, and, and she died. In fact, it was, sure, sure. And, and, she, and, that, and that was true. And, and, and then he also made a finding that she had no motive to lie, which I think is very important. And I think that that is a finding that's not supported by the record. I think there is no evidence on the fact whether the witness, Deborah Bell, had a motive to lie. I think, again, contrary to that. Isn't that something that you should have brought out on cross, or your office should have brought out on cross-examination, that she did have some type of motive, a relationship to the defendant, or? 
And that Some is extra grind? Yes, and we did, Your Honor. It's brought out in the documentary evidence in this case. Exhibit one was um, a collection of all of the statements. That the first statement that Deborah Bell gave to police, which is contrary to her affidavit, the statement her sister Betty Jo gave to police, which is contrary to her affidavit, and again, the sworn testimony of the eyewitness here, James Jackson, which is contrary to the affidavit. It wasn't the Commonwealth's burden at this motion for new trial hearing to present any evidence. It was the defendant's burden to present evidence to demonstrate, again, Again, that the affidavit, the substance of the affidavit, bears the persuasive indicia of trustworthiness. And I, I, I point to Judge Kaplan's findings here where he uses words of, you know, it appears that Deborah's statements were motivated by her pending death. It, it appears that they were, but in and of itself, that's not enough to demonstrate that actually these statements were true. There's a reason the dying declaration. But do they have to demonstrate that they're true or just that they're reliable and they're likely to be true? Or have some indicia of credibility. I mean, it's don't you don't have to rise to the level of absolute truth at that point, correct? Or knowing it anyway. Persuasive indicia of trustworthiness is the phrase. And I, I Yeah, I, I know what it means. <laughs> and I, I go back to I, I think the preliminary argument in my brief here is we should abandon the residual exception that this court adopted well, first round. I mean I, I, I don't get that. This is not our this comes from the US Supreme Court in Chambers. A that portion we adopted. of it, yes, Your Honor, a portion of it does, but this court in Evans found that the residual exception did not apply in Massachusetts. And I, How can we possibly say that the exculpatory exception to the hearsay rule, which the United States Supreme Court declares to be a matter of due process, does not apply in Massachusetts? I think that the rule in Chambers is much narrower than that. I think the rule in Chambers is we're just not applying a hearsay rule mechanicalistically, I think is the quote. It's we're, we, we still may have rules of evidence, and we still have hearsay, and we still have reliability barriers. Um, Chambers has then been expanded into the Silva Santiago third party culprit area. And I think we, it, it would be a similar analysis here. Third party culprit, are there substantial connecting links to the crime such that the hearsay is, is admissible? And here we need persuasive indicia of trustworthiness. When we go back to the Chambers case, um, there's five factors that Chambers talk about. Um, and again, I would note that Chambers is a very different factual situation where you have third party culprit evidence and you have statements against interest. I think that's very different than a witness coming forward and saying your eyewitness didn't see what he said he saw. Um, again, in Chambers, you talk about a spontaneous statement made shortly after the crime. That is not what we have here. We have an affidavit made a year and a half after the conviction, and the statement made immediately after the crime is to the contrary. Um, whether the statements are corroborated. Here, the only corroboration come in the similar form of the affidavits, which simply cannot be enough in and of themselves. Those I mean, affidavits. You're, you're referring to corroboration coming from Betty Jo Bell, who's also apparently died and from Joseph Anderson who no one can locate. Correct. So, but there is corroboration, albeit in affidavit form. And in admissible affidavit form as well. In, in, a, is in, in the form of inadmissible evidence. Um, whether the statements are numerous and independent, here you have sisters, I wouldn't call them independent. They have a relationship with the defendant and the co-defendant. Well, you say inadmissible. In Silva Santiago, we recognize that, that evidence that would otherwise be inadmissible might be admissible where necessary to accomplish due process. Uh, is it your view that if, this, if, you were to, to, if you were to fail to prevail today and this case would be retried, that the defense would not be able to offer what Deborah Bell told uh, the attorney and what, she, and what Betty Jo said Deborah Bell told her? Betty Jo Bell's affidavit has n never been offered as substantive evidence. No, Betty, jo, uh, Betty Jo's affidavit is not admissible. In, in a new trial, Not yes. admissible to say that Deborah Bell time and time and time again told her that she was in the bathroom at the time and that she felt badly that she had failed to come forward. Isn't that essentially what Betty Jo had said that Deborah had consistently told her over the course of time? That is Betty Jo's statement, but there's no admissible way to put that in front of a jury. That affidavit is not admissible. It, it does not satisfy, and nor has counsel proffered, that it satisfies the residual exception to the hearsay rule. Um, in, again, it's similar to, it's similar to, it's in the same situation as Deborah Bell's affidavit, except I think the plus factor that Deborah Bell has is that she knew she was facing the end. But again, we have not accepted a residual exception to the hearsay rule. 
we've accepted a due process exception to the hearsay rule. It constitutionally based, and again, it should be a very narrow exception. It needs to be so trustworthy such that a jury must have this evidence for the defendant to have due process and to have a fair trial, which I don't think is the case here. I, the first factor, and I recognize this court found contrary in the first round of Drayton, but was this affidavit critical to the defense? I don't believe that it was. I would urge this court but hasn't to- hasn't that ship sailed? I would urge this court to revisit that finding and find that it was not critical to the defense where it would simply impeach the eyewitness, which is what defense counsel, two experienced defense counsel did for three days. And again, that was the focus of the defense, was the, was the credibility and the veracity and the ability of the eyewitness to perceive what he said he saw. How, what do we, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you go. What, what do we do with the fact that Judge Quinlan, who actually tried the case, um, wasn't persuaded? Um, Judge Kaplan's in no different position than we are, except for he heard testimony from the lawyer, right? Correct. So, so what do we do with that? I think, I think this court needs to defer to Judge Quinlan's findings in the first um, decision that she made, both well, that but, she considered holding an evidentiary hearing and then found and, it was and, a warranted. And to use the chief's words, has that ship sailed too? Or why, why hasn't that ship sailed? No, because where this court remanded for an evidentiary hearing, I think we're back in that same posture where the judge, the motion judge made findings and this court is here to review them. We, I don't. Didn't we also remand for the, the new judge to also consider the Rule 30 aspect of it? We said remand, see if it's trustworthy. If so, then consider Rule 30. Correct. And, and, and just, just, just and I, I apologize for cutting, cutting off your, your answer to Justice Kafka, but that's what we're asking is, where does this analysis go where we have one judge saying mere impeachment and another judge saying kind of super impeachment? Correct, and I think that falls into this, the second category or the second issue for this court to resolve. First, whether the affidavit would be admissible at a new trial. If this affidavit is not persuasive and is not trustworthy, it is not admissible and the defendant does not need a new trial. Then second, does this affidavit cast doubt on the justice of the defendant's conviction such that it would have played a role in the jury's deliberations and made a difference if it were admitted at trial. What was Justice Kaplan to do? We, re we remanded the case and instructed the, new, the second judge, uh, Judge Quinlan having retired, to, to do a Rule 30 analysis. He, he did what he's supposed to do, right? He did what he was supposed to and then, do. And then we're just gonna say it doesn't really matter what he said? I think that he erred in not relying on Judge Quinlan's findings on those, on that issue, on how it would have affected the deliberation, how it would have affected the case. Where Judge Quinlan was the trial judge, she was in the best position, in a better position, respectfully, than this court, to determine how it would have played out. And but, she your, does, but your evidence was very thin at trial. I mean, it all rested on the testimony of uh, one person who Judge Kaplan noted changed his story Time and time again. I mean, when you yes, sort of say Honor. that Betty, that Deborah Bell changed her story, I believe he said that so did your key witness. And as far as I can tell, the only corroboration you had for that key witness was that you, you had a uh, fingerprint of Mr. Drayton found in the room, which is not terribly important because everybody understood that he, had, he was there. Uh, Yes, Your Honor, I, I agree. And, and that's where I think it's even more important that this was played out and this was fleshed out in front of a jury. It was for the jury to decide how credible and reliable Mr. Jackson was uh, based both uh, on the realm of his statements and on under cross-examination, again, by two very experienced. But, this jury, but the jury did not hear any testimony that Deborah Bell, on her essentially deathbed, said that I was in the bathroom with him when the shots were fired and he couldn't even he couldn't have seen who shot her and that Betty Jo said Deborah kept telling her this time and time again before she died and Joseph Anderson said I saw Deborah walk in the bathroom with uh, the key witness in the case shortly before I heard shots I mean the jury didn't hear that 
And the jury would never hear Betty Jo's statement or Joseph Anderson's statement unless he could be located. I think it's also important to consider if the jury were to hear Deborah Bell's affidavit, they would also hear her first statement to police, which is very different. Her statement to police initially and within um, days of this crime was helpful. The tenor of her, her um, discussion with police, it, she, she was responding to questions. It's contrary to her affidavit, and she provides information and clearly states that she was not there. But the jury would have all of that, and the jury would be able to decide based on all of that information. How can you say that it wouldn't have made a difference? The jury doesn't need to get to that point, and that's what I'm saying, is that here the defendant is not entitled to a new trial where he had a fair trial the first time around, and where Betty Jo and Deborah Bell were not called as witnesses. Um, Deborah Bell was not available at, at trial. She could not be located. But again, the, the, the ship has sailed, so to speak, and the jury had this case, and the jury's verdict should stand. But what, what, what do you do with that continuum of cases where You've cited them where, we, where we've said mere, mere impeachment, you, you don't get a new trial. But then we have Cowles and other cases where we've said, well, we know we said mere impeachment, but really good, what's called super impeachment, gets you a new trial, such that you have a thin case, one key witness, and arguably the facts in this case. What do you do with that? Don't we go to that line of cases and say that it, it, it's not mere impeachment? I think you can go to that line of cases in a similar line of cases where the eye, where a testifying witness comes back later and recants their testimony. That doesn't automatically mean a new trial to flesh all of this out. And I think this isn't, this is just mere impeachment, which goes back to the first part of this analysis of how trustworthy and how important and how credible is this affidavit. Does it all go back to our Rule 30 analysis which hinges on interests of justice as a bottom line? It, it, it does, but it also needs to start with the evidentiary principle and whether we have admissible evidence here. And I, again, I don't think that this court intended for the residual exception to be so broad. Is that because you're, you're, you're focused on the original dying declaration requirements, which is the third prong of that, which says it's got to be about why you're dying. And, it, and that's where we messed up in the first Drayton case because we basically made a dying declaration without credible on anything? I think in the first Drayton case, this court noted that the dying declaration and its rationale may encompass the statement. And that's where sending it back for additional evidence um, under the residual exception. But the only reason the only reason I take it you're saying it's credible, I, well, you're, you're, you disagree with it, but the I'm trying to understand the logic of, I wasn't here for the first rate, and so I'm thinking and learning as we go here, but I take it we're saying that a dying declaration about anything is trustworthy. That's um, essentially what the motion judge found. Right, and that's inconsistent with a lot of our cases, which says only dying declarations about why you were, why you're dying. But we've now created a credible enlargement to that exception when it's necessary in a Correct. thin case for, for due process. Correct. A constitu there's nothing credible about this statement except for that it's repeated by her sister, except for that she gives it while she's dying, right? And I would be very careful to say while she is dying. Um, she's about, she's close to death. She is, and I, I, again, don't dispute those factual findings, but it, it certainly does not fit within the hearsay exception for a dying declaration. And I haven't read Wigmore and all those things in a long time, but we've, we've, we've found some psychological basis for people telling the truth on their deathbed. Concerning the circumstances of their death, correct. But not on other things. No. This is not one of those areas where we've developed all that sociological studies, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. The court has no further questions. One, one more thing. The issue is not whether it was a fair trial. The, the court in Drayton found it was a fair trial. Yes, Your Honor. The issue was whether or not newly discovered evidence is appropriate to prevent a substantial risk or likelihood of miscarriage of justice. Isn't that sort of the core issue? 
It is, and I think it's also important to note that this court is now in the same position that it was at when it reviewed the defendant's conviction under 33E. Nothing has material. No, it's not because the judge heard the testimony of the attorney who could, and he could evaluate the credibility of the attorney. I, 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 he could not, of course, evaluate Deborah Bell. She had Correct. passed away, but. And that's as far as it gets, and that doesn't get us any further to whether Deborah Bell's affidavit, the substance, in, in fact, is credible. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Neves, good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, Catherine Neves, on behalf of the defendant appellee, Kenji Drayton. Um, I would like to start with the um, questions about what do you do with Judge Quinlan's decision. This court already reviewed Judge Quinlan's decision and decided in the first Drayton case that the case needed to be remanded for an evidentiary hearing because it wasn't mere impeachment evidence. Did, did we hold that or do we hold that there was an error of law and Judge Quinlan in fairness didn't have the, 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 the benefit of the Drayton decision in making her Drayton decision. <laughs> so, so she said that, she said it's not admissible and then she said, and by the way, were it admissible, this testimony, and we remanded it for that critical finding of trustworthiness under the Chamber's line. Um, yes. And then said to, to the new judge, do the Rule 30 analysis as, as well. But I don't know, I, I mean, did we say that we reject the mere impeachment? I don't remember reading that in the judge's well, decision. Well, what the court said is that an affidavit that directly contradicts the testimony of the sole purported eyewitness to a crime, likewise, as in a third party culprit uh, defense, undermines the prosecution's case in a way that is indirect yet potentially powerful. So in recognizing the very limited constitutionally based uh, chamber's uh, exception to the hearsay rule, the court said that you know this appears to be this may fall within that category. So this by, is by, so by accepting chambers, we in essence said this isn't this is more than mere impeachment. Correct. That's your argument, right? Correct. So so the court already has reviewed Judge Quinlan's decision, and that's why you remanded it back uh, for an evidentiary hearing. I, so I, at this point, we are at the question of whether Judge Kaplan abused his discretion, committed a clear error of law, or a clear error in judgment. But, but Judge Kaplan has no better sense of the truth of the underlying statement than we do, right? All he knows, he believes the lawyer, right? Um, he, that he, and we're, we haven't seen that, and we can't question that. The lawyer is credible and trustworthy. Correct. But I, I'm, I get back to, why is this dying declaration trustworthy? Um, be, it's be, not a dying declaration. The court recognized that in the first straight decision, it isn't, but The it, only thing different about her at the end, when she's testifying the opposite way, is that she's dying, right? She 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 gave testimony bef before. She didn't. She never testified, Your well, Honor. Well, I thought she spoke to the police and she, she gave, never was. She was interviewed. Right. She right. never brought up that she's in the bathroom with the That's guy. That's correct. So I guess it just seems like we've we've gutted our dying declaration analysis. I, I, with respect, Your no, Honor, no, you, you really- Tell me why I'm wrong. I'm not- Yeah, you I, really have not, because what the court recognized in Drayton is that this is, an ex, this is a chambers-type exception, and so if it applies, it will, apply, it will apply in only the rarest cases, and what must be demonstrated is that it is both critical to the defense and it bears persuasive assurances I, I, I understand. of trustworthiness. I, understand. I have no quibble with the chambers exception. I have no quibble with that it's- um, it's the reliability prong of what we're doing. Well, uh, then the, yes, and then the question, which the court sent the case back to determine, is that the court recognized that a statement that is completely contradictory to the sole eyewitness in the case, that that would be critical to the defense. But that's the, the first but the part. But the determ right, the determination. That part's easy for you. Yes, it's the I'm, second part. Yes, I'm, I, and okay. I'm, <laughs> so you remanded for the question of whether it bore persuasive assurances of trustworthiness. That's, that I in get its, lost on. Right, in your decision, uh, you gave the indication that like a dying declaration, 
um, Deborah Bell was faced with her imminent death and that she had remained and hidden from the police, from authorities, from defense counsel, uh, until she was eight weeks before dying, where but, she but, calls. But that gets back to my question. Didn't we just find her more credible only because she's dying, um, and we've changed the dying declaration analysis? I don't think so. I think that the question. So how else, have, what else tells us that she's credible now besides the fact? Well, I think what else tells you that she's credible now, despite what my sister said about the record, is that um, the court indicated, the SJC indicated, this court indicated that um, Judge Kaplan uh, could, you know, take evidence concerning maybe other motives she might have had. If you look at the evidence in this case, you have Judge uh, Attorney Grossberg testifying that he looked for her, couldn't find her, nobody could find her. The DA says that in the record. But I would point to um, the fact that she had no relationship, no motive uh, to come forward on Mr. Drayton's behalf um, at this time. She never came forward until she was uh, eight weeks from dying. And in her police interview uh, with uh, Boston detectives, she said about Mr. Drayton, I just started seeing him. I mean, maybe twice in a week I would see him. He just started coming around. Confirms that she saw him two times a week over the last couple months. She thought he was supplying drugs to the apartment. And that's at the record appendix at page 114. Again, later in her statement to the police, she says she refers to Mr. Drayton as the KK guy. That was his nickname. And that's at record appendix page 118. The fact that the Drayton uh, family and the Bell family were not known to each other is confirmed by Betty Jo Bell. In her interview, police interview, she stated that she had been going to the apartment for only two weeks before the shooting. She got drugs from Mr. Drayton. She saw him like about three times, and that she never knew Drayton before she saw him at the apartment. That's at the record appendix 94 to 96. At her, she testified at the suppression hearing, Betty Jo Bell, who is the sister, she said that she had relapsed two weeks before the shooting, and that's why she had started going there. Her sister had been going there more often, and she saw Drayton, she consistently said she saw Drayton a total of three times and had no interactions with him. That two-month timeline is so consistent. At the, so at the, the subsequent hearing before Judge Kaplan, there was evidence presented to, to undermine her original police statements? I'm, I'm trying to... Um, no, her, there, there was testimony uh, in accordance with this court's decision uh, to develop the evidence. Uh, the court said in a footnote that trial counsel could be called to testify about his observations about Deborah Bell when she came to see him. So the trial so, counsel, trial counsel we, we've got testimony that says the trial counsel believed her. Um, I guess, is that well, essentially? Well, trial, trial counsel simply said that, yes, he believed her, that she looked sickly. She called him out of the blue. He had, he had tried to find her consistently because there were these police interviews. Before trial, um, could not find her. Nobody could find her. He put out feelers in the community. Uh, nobody could find her. Uh, he kept trying to find her even after the trial because uh, he had felt strongly that this this was a very rough case that Mr. Drayton was convicted of based on the testimony of James Jackson. So he had kept trying to find the Bell sisters By the way, it, it, and the couldn't Kaplan find hearing, them. Kaplan hearing, nothing's developed about um, Deborah Bell's relationship with Jackson, whether it had disintegrated oh, over time or... or no. Oh, no. I, I mean, Deborah Bell... Because there um, are lots, lots of other reasons why you may want to undermine Mr. Jackson. You know, maybe he was a bad boyfriend or whatever. I don't, I but think none of that came in, right? She, well, no, she, her, her statements uh, were consistent that James Jackson was someone she cared about. She said that in her interview with police, and she said that she in her affidavit. She didn't testify because she's, she's dead, but yes, I'm trying I, to understand, yes, who, was, was there anything developed about the relationship between Ms. Jackson, uh, Mr. Jackson and Ms. Bell at the, that subsequent hearing? No. Okay. Can I, can I ask you a question about this? distinction between the Quinlan finding and the Kaplan finding. So what I, what I asked Ms. Anderson is this whole kind of continuum in the, in, the, in the conundrum we've placed trial judges in when we ask them to, to preside over, they preside over motions for new trial, 
and the Commonwealth comes in and says, this is mere impeachment, and then we have something different. Where are we as far as a legal standard? What guidance do we give to defense counsel, prosecutors, and trial judges about the distinction between mere, ev mere impeachment evidence, which doesn't give you a new trial, and that which does give you a new trial? And, and I know there's an, a Rule 30 overlay, but it can't be just that it doesn't feel right that it's a miscarriage of justice. So what, what do we do for guidance? Well, I, th I mean, I, I think the difference is if Deborah Bell had been alive and testified consistent with her affidavit, she was an eye, a percipient eyewitness whose testimony directly contradicted James Jackson, who was a percipient eyewitness. And so both of those testimonies are equally substantive for their full probative value, and it's left to the jury to decide who you believe. If you believe James Jackson, then it's a guilty because he says, you know, if the jury believes him, he saw Mr. Drayton shoot. If you believe Deborah Bell, nobody, neither one of them saw Mr. Drayton or anybody shoot Mr. Green because they were in the bathroom at the time. That's a different, it's not an impe it's not impeachment. It's that a, they're both right, eyewitnesses. So, so, yeah, so the characterization of it as impeachment may be unfair. It's, I, I believe so, Your Honor. I believe, I believe so. I, I, I think, and Judge Kaplan noted that at well, the he said it was, as well. Well, he said it was going to be a not guilty. I mean, he went a little, well, right, he went he, a little far, right, and, and even the, you say that. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, it's, that the question then is, you know, if it fits within that um, narrow escape hatch, which, you know, this case, I think, presents a perfect storm of that. Uh, you know, it, one eyewitness, no corroboration, impeached, impeached with, you know, drug abuse, alcohol, timing, who was there, who was not there. His statement changed every time he took the stand or gave a statement. And no, no physical evidence, no forensic evidence that would tend to show that it was Mr. Drayton. In those circumstances, and then you have a woman who the Commonwealth concedes is unavailable, makes herself unavailable. She's, she's you know, an addict. She's out on the street. She wants nothing to do with this. Uh, detectives Harris and Keeler find her right afterward. But after that, she's in the weeds, and nobody can find her. And nobody does find her. The attorney can't find her. She calls him out of the blue. She goes to see him. She's got a headscarf. She's emotional. As Mr. Grossberg said, it, see, it seemed to me that she was trying to settle her affairs. She said she had this on her conscience. That's the perfect storm of why this affidavit is reliable and trustworthy, along with the record evidence that she had no motive to help Mr. Drayton. If she did, I think Mr. Grossberg would have found her, and she might have helped out sooner. She had no relationship with him. The person she had the relationship with was James Jackson, who she told the police right afterward. Um, I argued with him because of the, it was too much madness in his house, too many dealers, too many people in and out. Mr. Drayton was one of the people who she was referring to as too much madness. She had no motive to help him until eight weeks before, and she knew she was dying. Can I ask a question about the um, the affidavit? Is is there a difference in your mind about whether, on the one hand, it's um, got indicia of trustworthiness, and on the other hand, whether it would be admissible in a new trial? I think I think if I think it is admissible under this court's decision uh, in Drayton one uh, that if it if it has those sufficient assurances of trustworthiness, then under Chambers it's admissible. Um, and um, as Your Honor noted, uh, yes, then Deborah's prior statement comes in where she says, I came and I left early, and then I came back, and I argued with James Jackson about the madness in his house, and I left. So as in a trial, um, and Attorney Grossberg can testify about what he saw when she came to him, what he observed, what she looked like, and the affidavit would come in. And, you know, that would be the state of the evidence based on, on this court's decision. I have a, an odd question. Is Mr. Jackson dead or is he still alive? We I, don't know. I do not know, Your Honor. Uh, at the evidentiary hearing, the Commonwealth did not, told the court they, they did not know either. But if there were to be a retrial, his testimony would still be admissible from the first trial? Correct. Absolutely. <clears throat> 
Absolutely. Um, unless the court has any other further questions, I would rest on my brief. Thank you. Thank you.